All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, people will start trickling in, that's totally fine. Um, you guys are hopefully all here to talk about security and defense in depth. Uh, we're gonna be talking about best practices around uh, how you can secure uh, not only your Drupal site, but the stack that it runs on as well, um, and some lessons learned along the way. Uh, so I'm Nick Stilau. Uh, I'm director of engineering at Pantheon. Uh, so we run about 100,000 Drupal and WordPress sites, and uh, have uh, learned along the way a lot of. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of different attacks and uh, different uh, exploits, um, and learned a lot along the way building the platform. And hoping to share some of that today with you. I'm Chris Deitzel, the founder of Cellardor Media. Um, we're a development and consultancy firm based out of Seattle. Uh, I've done everything from small sites all the way up to architected large-scale e-commerce for um, uh, actually African airlines. And so um, when you deal with uh, security on the level of uh, major e-commerce, it's, uh, it's a whole new game. So, Yeah, and I'm uh, Luke Provasco. I am the uh, GM of Drupal Business up at Townsend Security. We're a data security company, have enterprise clients uh, worldwide. Uh, and are really excited to be uh, working within the Drupal community. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm excited to be presenting with uh, two great co-presenters. We each kind of bring a different perspective on the on the security world. Uh, my perspective is more um, a little bit less kind of uh, specific to Drupal, but more kind of on the technology um, uh, on the platform side. Um, and so that's kind of where my expertise will help guide us today. And I'm coming at it from the Drupal architecture side, uh, from the developer side. If you're a dev shop, if you own a shop, if you're a freelancer, what can you do to protect yourself? And I come from uh, basically a security company. Um, you know, we we work with a lot of uh, clients, so I understand their, you know, concerns. Um, a lot of people come to us for a couple different reasons. Uh, primarily meeting compliance uh, or needing to manage their risk of a data breach. And I love this slide uh, because it is very true. Uh, there are only two types of companies, those that have, have been hacked and those that will be. Even that is merging into one category, those that have been hacked and will be again. We are seeing that uh, it just shows uh, that it's absolutely important to have security at the forefront of your Drupal projects. Um, if Drupal is going to be considered an enterprise class CMS, uh, businesses care about is this going to meet my business needs and is it going to be secure? So you have to build security in from the ground up in order to prove that Drupal is the right CMS for the enterprise. And does it keep your CEO out of the headlines? Yeah. Yeah, so I think we're, uh, throughout the talk, we'll be kind of talking about uh, from a couple different angles. One is kind of about what you can do to secure your sites and, uh, or, you know, secure your business. Um, but then part of it also is just kind of what does security mean to Drupal, to the community in general, as we want that community to grow? Uh, son of a breach. You cannot afford to be hacked. Uh, these numbers are real. Uh, the Ponymon Institute puts these out every year. These are the latest numbers. Three and a half million dollars per breach or $145 per record. Uh, I don't know too many uh, businesses that could go through one, let alone two of those. Um, and just an astounding number. Uh, there, there's a, a website you can go to. Uh, as of 428, I mean, it just blows my mind that there's been over 100 million records exposed. So times that by $145 uh, per record, that's a lot of money getting spent on uh, data breaches. And we're going to be doing a little audience participation just to get people going before lunch. So if you would go ahead right now and raise your hand if you don't want to participate in any of the things we're going to do. Okay, that's looking good. I'm Perfect. feeling good about this. So like, <laughs> just to start off, like who's gotten a credit card, uh, a new credit card sent to them by their bank? Like I have, and actually it just happened that, like Sunday evening before I flew down here. For the, for the record, the people that are watching this online, that was every hand in the room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so, you know, th this, this stuff's really happening. You can see some of it uh, with your Drupal sites and the kind of exploits you hear about in the community, um, but you can also, you know, uh, see it through your daily life, through your interactions with your bank or how your uh, online experiences are changing with the different organizations you work with on um, you know, and to drive the point home a little bit more, this is a public uh, service announcement from the FBI, and 
uh, from about a month ago. And they, I think they need a little work on their website because it was actually like a lot harder to download this than it should have <laughs> been or just load the page. But this is, uh, this is something from the FBI about a month ago saying like in the same word, basically like ISIS and WordPress. Like, like, you know, like, so this stuff is going on, right? Like, this isn't just like, oh, you know, my, you know, whatever, right? This is like the FBI and ISIS and WordPress all in the same sentence in the past month, right? So all of that to say, you're going to get hacked. Unless your site is permanently offline and you're just using it on your local machine, you have to assume that your site is going to get hacked. Um, I work with uh, a, a large company right now, and we just did a security audit, and they, the security team came to us and said, Plan on your PHP being exploited. Plan on your database being breached. What are you going to do about all of that? How can you protect it in the event of everything that you own is being given out? So <laughs> don't freak out. This is all the, the, the FUD at the top there. It's fear, uncertainty, doubt. This is what a lot of people will try to push at you. And we want to make sure that you guys uh, walk away from today with, with practical steps, with real uh, world scenarios that you're not just running around freaking out like, oh my God, I'm going to get hacked, the world is going to end, and I should just stop what I'm doing and crawl into a hole. So um, don't worry, we'll, we'll walk you through it. So the first step is building uh, a security consciousness um, for you and your team. Yeah, so that's right. Like you can, you know, like there are people you can pay to help you with security. There are like, you know, legal <laughs> entities like from the government that help you handle security. There are compliance organizations. There's a whole ecosystem. But the one thing that you really cannot buy is educating yourself. And so, you, you know, when you think about security, the thing, your responsibility to yourself and your colleagues and the business owners and the sites that you create is to educate yourself and be able to think objectively about security. So really it's about a frame of mind right security isn't something you implement or you do or you buy or you like you prevent this attack or that attack uh, you know it's really about a, a frame of mind I think great security people when they walk into a room are kind of like exits fire escape <laughs> like no security guard by the door you know are just kind of like noticing stuff noticing how stuff could be broken how stuff could be breached and um, you know, so you don't want to be paranoid, but you don't want to be like ignorant either about this stuff. Well, and the real goal. <laughs> yeah, I, I also think as Drupal developers, you guys have a responsibility to your clients to be setting them up for success. And you know, if they get a breach or when they get a breach, they're going to say, "What the hell, guys? I thought I paid you a lot of money to make sure that I didn't have to go through this." And so, yeah, I, and I just think it's it, you got to do it. Yeah, from a developer mindset, every time I walk into a bidding process or an RFP, the first thing I think about is. What data is there? How do I secure it? What do I have to do? Um, and that should be on every developer's mind as they're going through this. Right. So, you know, another way you can look at this is kind of um, uh, risk mitigation. How much, it, like, how much are you investing in security and what uh, risks do those mitigate? Um, it's also important to think of kind of what bucket you fall into. If you're doing a, um, you know, a hair salon brochureware website, that might not be such a big target. If you're working with a kind of um, activist or political organization, that might be, uh, you know, could be a target, and you're going to want to invest more. So part of it is just understanding kind of, uh, you know, how in order to understand how much you want to invest in security, it's also understanding what um, what uh, risk profile you have, and uh, whether you'll get away with kind of best practices or um, going a little more in depth or a kind of a very locked down uh, locked down. Just to double check, can everyone in the back hear us? Yep, raise your hand. Awesome, cool. Um, just double checking. We have loud voices, and I don't like microphones, so I'll tend to walk away from it and come back. But hopefully, the folks that are going to watch this later online don't mind that. So, okay, more audience participation. Uh, who here is working on a project that involves compliance? Raise your hand. And I bet there's probably a lot more hands that aren't raised because you might not really get that simple things like an email address or a username are also fall under compliance regulations. So I bet that that's going to probably <laughs> raise a few more hands. Uh, the thing about compliance, it's not optional. Um, and compliance is also the low bar for data security. Uh, you know, I, 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 I read a lot of the industry, uh, you know, magazines and journals and whatnot, and, and the common theme is that 
Compliance is just the stuff that you should be doing at the absolute bare minimum. It's not going to necessarily prevent you from a breach. It's just like the low bar. You, you, you got to do more. But for a lot of people, that, that, that can be difficult. But I just urge you to just look at a lot of the compliance regulations if you're just trying to get a feel for what you need to do security-wise. Uh, PCI DSS is a great one. Um, and just look, what do these compliance requirements uh, say I need to do? And that's what you should be shooting for right out the gate. There's also some uh, studies, I'll make up some statistics, but um, that I think it's like 85% of companies are out of compliance within two weeks of their last audit, right? So if you're really thinking about it from a compliance angle, you're probably not really thinking like holistically, like, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of thinking about the low bar. You really want to be integrating this into the entire uh, life cycle. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about the CIA security triad, not the governmental CIA. Uh, stands for confidentiality, confidentiality, uh, integrity, and availability. And this is not something that we made up. So, um, Unlike is, the others. <laughs> yeah. Like some of the others. Yeah. <laughs> not author's opinion. Um, you, can, you can certainly go online and, and learn a little bit more about this. But just to kind of briefly talk about it, um, confidentiality is roughly equivalent to privacy. And data encryption is actually a common method for ensuring confidentiality. Uh, User, like I said, user IDs and passwords constitute uh, things that you need to encrypt. And also, two-factor authentication uh, is becoming the norm. And, and just one thing I like, want to stress is always err on the side of more confidentiality. Uh, you don't want to be the, the you know, when, when the CEO comes down and says, uh, what's going on? And you just say, well, I, mean, I thought it was secure. You know, it's, it's, you get, it's all, all these items are a part of a defense in depth approach to data security. Uh, the next is integrity. Um, this talks about uh, data integrity. Is the data that you're receiving um, the data that was intended for you to receive? Are you, uh, did somebody man in the middle attack it? Are you sure that you're securing your connections um, in and out? And then it also goes back to don't trust your users. Just because somebody says that they're, you know, <clears throat> that they're an admin, um, don't give them the ability to write arbitrary PHP in your notes. Um, <laughs> The admin password could get hacked, and just because they say that they're the password or they're the admin doesn't necessarily mean that you should just give them every right in the world to explore your system. And then, uh, uh, culminating with availability, so this gets to kind of denial of service attacks. So if someone's um, attacking your site or um, your service in a way that it's not able to provide the value that it's supposed to to the customer, if your site is down, uh, that's not a, that's not a secure site, and so. One of the uh, one of the reasons I think this the CIA tried is important is that like security is a big topic, right? So it's really helpful just have this as a very simple framework for kind of breaking down the different types of threats, what uh, you know, how they might be able to uh, impact your system, whether that's um, updating data that you don't know about or getting data that should be private or taking your site down. So if you can kind of decompose security, you can start to talk about it a little. And the thing I really like about this image is that it's a, a full loop and that if you break any one of these, your security goes out the door. Um, you can have the most confidential um, system, you can have it be 100% uptime, um, and somebody man in the middle attacks you and you've just lost everything. Uh, same thing with availability, you can do it all, but if you can never access it or the, the site goes down, then um, you're SOL. So. What does hacked mean? Um, these are the, when we think of hacked, this is what we think of. Um, I actually did have a client call me and say, uh, not the site that I had built them, luckily, but a site that they were, um, their brand was associated with was hacked by ISIS. And sure enough, there was this big, you know, we are ISIS and, and this is what we believe and all sorts of um, highly inflammatory things on their branded website. Um, so th this is kind of what we, we think of, but it's also, denial of service, it's um, a data breach. It, can, it doesn't necessarily have to be somebody getting in and changing your front page or changing data on your page. It can be as simple as just pulling small bits of information over time that will, that will slowly leak and, and cause a bigger issue. Yes, so defacement is actually in some ways the, the happy yeah. case because you go there and you know. And from a sample size of three, if your homepage is black and it's not supposed to be, if there's a really creepy joker, and then like a general like Guy Fox on your homepage is like a general sign. You might Chances are it's yeah, not it's your not site. A good thing. <laughs> but maybe it is. <laughs> so the next is defense in depth. Um, 
Security, as um, you guys may well know, is not just a single level approach. It is a multi-level approach and you have to um, go at it from many, many different angles. So this, uh, this spans the gamut from, um, from kind of the, you know, everything from the, your hosting solution and the network there to the um, uh, physical machines you're using, the OS, a, lo a lot of the tools you're running on the OS, your web server, your database server, up through the JavaScript, even to the team you work with to make sure they're aware of security. Um, maybe you're using a CDN. So there's a lot there to cover. And I think one uh, quote I love, <laughs> or one way to think about this I love, is like the belt and suspenders approach. You're like, you know, this belt works pretty good. These suspender suspenders are pretty fly, but I think with both of them, I'll be like very sure that your pants my, are pan my yeah, pants, your pants aren't going to fall. Off. <laughs> so you know, you don't just want to get one control. You want to have as many controls over the whole stack. And as we were talking about earlier, it doesn't matter how strong everything is if you have a weak link. Uh, more audience participation. How many of you have had somebody email you and say, hey, here's the root uh, password to my server? Yeah, uh, a client that owns their own owns their own server says, hey, I just spun it up on GoDaddy, here's the root to it. Um, you can be as, as hardened as you want and that one email can just break everything apart. So make sure that you, you know, don't allow root access via password. Um, don't even allow root access. Don't even use root. Use a, uh, your own user harden it with um, with keys, and we'll talk about this later, um, and and just go through some basic steps of, and, and part of this, uh, like that example, is you have to teach um, the end users who aren't going to be the security conscious ones. All of us know, okay, we don't use root, we don't pass it around, but you really need to tell uh, your client when they send you that email, look, you probably shouldn't do this, you've just caused me a lot more issues than you've solved, so. So are you vulnerable? Are you vulnerable right now? That's a good question, and it's actually kind of hard to answer. Um, there are, so part of the, you know, if you don't know if you're vulnerable, it's gonna be hard to really, uh, you know, get an actionable plan for, um, for mitigating those risks. Um, so there are a couple different ways you can, uh, that you can kind of keep up to date on security updates. So a great one is US CERT, which is a, a federal entity which kind of helps um, aggregate and disseminate information about this. If, uh, um, uh, but you're also going to want to keep up to date on kind of like any mailing list for any software you're using. Maybe that's uh, the Apache Web Server or Nginx. Maybe that's MySQL, MariaDB. Maybe that's Varnish or Squid or anything like that. Also, depending on your OS, right, you're going to want to follow your OS uh, security mailing list. So maybe that's Fedora, Ubuntu, Debian, whatever that is. Um, but there's like a, you know, so there's like a couple great resources, but really there's no one great place where you can hear if there is a, uh, if there's an exploit that might affect you. Um, and uh, I think one, one, uh, one of the best tools I've found for this is Twitter. And um, it involves, you know, just like following, you know, the, it's the people I follow, but um, that's often I found out, find out about exploits on Twitter before, you know, US CERT kind of gets to it. There may be a couple of days, days behind, uh, maybe before, um, uh, you know, it's kind of gone to the mailing list or something like that, so. And one other good thing is follow your own Twitter handle from a different Twitter handle so that you can see if somebody's actually using yours. So, um, and if you're a Drupal developer, um, the security team is awesome. Um, they have a full list of a rundown of every uh, security update to core, what was uh, affected, how it's affected, the severity of it. Um, you'll see all the information you need there to make the decision on um, how does this affect you and, and what do you need to do. So uh, we're just going to switch gears a little bit and, and just talk briefly about compliance. Um, what, what I, what's interesting about compliance is oftentimes organizations fall under multiple regulations. Uh, I've had a lot of conversations here at DrupalCon with uh, universities. Um, and if you think about universities, uh, actually, let's see, how, how many people are here from, or from a college or a university? Wow, that's awesome. Uh, you guys are like just mini villages. You guys, you take in student data, you have faculty data, you ha often have donor information. You know, you also uh, probably have uh, health centers for the students. So you you got HIPAA, you have your state privacy laws, your federal if, privacy laws. If you're really lucky or maybe unlucky as a developer, you could kind of work on a site that might hit all of all those. Of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if you work at a state you school, busy. you probably do. <laughs> so. Um, you know, additionally, uh, 
I, and I mentioned this earlier, if, if you're, you're, as Drupal developers, you should also be asking your clients if they fall under compliance regulations, because sometimes they just don't volunteer that, and then, you know, towards the end of the project, it's like, oh, by the way. Uh, oh, yeah, we have to do this. Uh, can we get that done in a week? Um, so, <laughs> a, a couple chuckles, people have heard that before. <laughs> so, um, what, what, what's interesting about compliance requirements is it's up to you. Uh, or well, it's up to you and ultimately up to your clients. But uh, PCI pretty explicitly says um, that no hosting provider can actually make you compliant. Um, I think that that's often uh, a misunderstanding uh, within uh, developers. Um, a hosting provider can uh, provide a, it's called an OA, or AOC, an attestation of compliance for their for their platform but that doesn't extend to you. And I'll, I just wanna say that again because it's really important. That does not extend to you. You need to put the proper controls in place. You need to be doing the encryption. You need to be doing the key management. You need to be doing all the security things. Your hosting provider, they, they can set you up to, to, to succeed, but ultimately it's up to you. And I liken it to you spend all this money on building a, an armored vehicle, but you don't wanna roll around with the windows down, right? Just because you have this platform that is the most secure thing around, it's it's not inherited that you're going to be secure. It's up to you to make sure that you're using it properly to be secure. Yeah, and I like the idea of uh, uh, often it's phrased as shared responsibility, and you know I think that comes back to that security is a responsibility. It isn't something you can uh, you can you know do at the end of the project, or isn't something you can buy, or isn't something you can you know like a module you can install a single module. Yeah, and just, just further, uh, regulations like PSS make it very, very clear that in the event of the breach, it is the enterprise, not the hosting provider or development agency that's responsible. So uh, it's also, I mean, you have reputational risk because you've developed that site, but uh, ultimately it is your client. So um, I always find this slide particularly interesting um, because PII or personally identifiable information is uh, not just a credit card or a social security number. Um, I mean, those are the obvious ones, right? But but like I mentioned earlier, things like your login name, um, your email address, I mean, gosh, even if you're collecting IP addresses. Uh, as websites become uh, a lot more personal, they know who you are, they're collecting this information. That stuff needs to be protected. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, well, we can just keep going here. Cool. So, um, had a little another little exercise. So everybody raise their hand up, and then we're gonna lower it. Ev even you, and then you as well. <laughs> everybody, right. each right. one of you. Okay, cool. So now lower your hand if you live east of the Mississippi Re River. Okay, I ran the numbers, and this is gonna work out perfectly. Um, lower you your hand if you do not own a dog. Uh, yeah, lower your hand if you are not born in February. Yeah, that guy, those two in the back, three in the back, stand up. So we, we went from like, I don't know how many people are in this room, maybe 200 to like two people with like three totally like random, pieces, of, random pieces of data that you wouldn't really worry about. But in this group, if we, if we had that, we could identify those guys kind of. And so that's even stuff like, you know, your zip code, uh, date, month of birth, the state, you know, whether you like Coke or Pepsi more can kind of help like, uh, like target you. And so that's, that's kind of what, you know, good ad agencies are doing, I guess, but it's also what good, um, you know, good hackers are able to do with seemingly inconsequential pieces of information. And there was a, there was a high profile um, instance of this where um, even data that you think is secure or that you think your, um, you know, the services that you're using, using are keeping secure, uh, there was a guy who, um, I believe he was an editor for Engadget or Wired, um, one of the major tech blogs, um, had a very um, short one-word Twitter handle, um, worth a lot of money, and so somebody called up Amazon, and Amazon said, well, I'm sorry, can you answer your security question? He kind of BSed around with them. They said, okay, well, uh, can you give me the last four digits uh, or the, the security code on the card that ends in one, two, three, four? And he goes, uh, and then hung up, called Apple and said, oh, um, and Apple said, well, can you just verify the last four digits of your credit card, which he just got from Amazon. So he's able to verify it, hacked into the iCloud account, deleted everything on the guy's computers, all of his family photos, everything he had. So this is something that is actively happening, and it's something that you have to be aware of, um, even in from, from a, a 
as you're developing standards and practices within your companies, what data are we going to give out and how are we going to give that out? And could that data be then used to build a, uh, a social hack on somebody? Sweet. So we're going to just go into a couple things that you should absolutely be doing. And, um, uh, and if you're not doing them, uh, it's totally fine just to get up from the room and go. And <laughs> or just cower just and shake. Just get on it. Right uh, now. But, but, but these are the things, if you do nothing else, you have to be doing these. Um, the first one is back up your data. Um, <laughs> Uh, I can't I can't stress this enough. Um, backups are going to save you in the long run, um, no matter how you do it. Um, the I mean, an example that I give is um, I have a, a, a newborn, and uh, I was up at you know 5:30 in the morning feeding him, um, and I'm sitting there and he's sleeping in my arms, and all of a sudden I get a ping from Pingdom that your site is down. I go and I look at it, and something catastrophic that the the uh, content admins had added in caused all these issues and whatnot, and rather than trying to deal with it with a sleeping child in my hand, I, um, I was using Pantheon at the time, but I logged in, and within two or three clicks, I had restored a backup, the site was back up and running, and my child was still sleeping. So um, in that instance, a backup saved me not only um, an issue with the client, but it also saved me some personal um, time trying to get my son back to sleep. So just back up your data, store it somewhere, store it somewhere safe. Um, don't store it on the same place where all your other data is because if all your data is breached or you lose it, um, then your backup is worthless. So keep it offsite, keep it somewhere, store it you know, wherever you can. Um, and there's tons of services available that'll allow you to do that. In conjunction with that, you should be using some sort of source um, source code management. and, and Everyone here hopefully is using Git. If you're not, you know, Git with the program, um, pun intended. Uh, but Git allows you to, in the event of a breach, um, one of the first things you can do, and we'll talk about this later, is is you react by loading a backup and reverting your Git repo. Um, that's going to clean up a lot of your issues. It's not going to clean up any everything, but it's the first step that you can do. And if you have Git, you know what files have been changed, where they've been changed, and how they've been changed. And if you can't um, if you can't identify that, then you're going to have to go line by line by line through the entire Drupal core and figure out where that little exploit is. Um, whereas if you can hit one button and get revert, you're going to be in a much better position. Yeah, so an another one is just use secure passwords, right? There are tools that can help with this, whether it's 1Password uh, or um, LastPass or KeePassX if you're on Linux. Um, and uh, this is kind of the XKCD joke about this, which I don't even, well, it's kind of funny, but <laughs> really, I think just use, you know, one login, last pass, let you just create random passwords, right? This is just something you should be doing. It's something you should be doing for yourself. It's something you should be doing for your family, and it's something you should be doing for the team you work with, right? Uh, there are, um, well, we could go into some slides about, like, the SSH attacks we see on Pantheon, and, like, you know, not like we use passwords, um, we, you know, we use certificates, but like there are just thousands of attempts like continuously, and that you know that goes across the web. You also don't want, uh, you know, when Gizmodo gets hacked, you don't want your password there to be the same as your password for like Amazon or something like that. Um, so just take, you know, uh, educate yourself and, and your team on basic uh, best uh, best practices. On One strategy I use personally for that is I have an ultra unsecure password that I give to every site that I don't even care about. Um, and that way, you know, if that thing gets hacked, great. You've just accessed some site that I'll never access again, and it has no information about me. Um, to, you know, layer your passwords. Use different passwords. And it's all about entropy. Don't use, you know, your wife's name or your dog's name or your birthday or password 123. Use something that has enough entropy in it that's going to um, protect you and your, your, uh, your environment. So another one is two-factor auth. So not every service supports this, but everyone that does that you use, you should be using this. You might think it's a little bit of a pain, and it is a little bit of a pain, but uh, it's much less of a pain than you know, like having your stuff hacked or your um, uh, you know, uh, uh, identity taken or something like that. And once you get in the swing of it, kind of like everything else, it's really easy to use. At Pantheon, we use YubiKeys, which are the one on the top left. All, you know, Google Authenticator, RSA, Authy, there's like a bunch of great options that can uh, help introduce someone yeah, and just to kind of go elaborate on that a little bit, two-factor authentication is something you know and something you have. Uh, if you ask, let's say, your mother's maiden name and what was the name of your first pet, 
that's not two factor authentication, that's one factor twice. Um, so just, I wanna make sure everyone's <laughs> clear on that. And, and just to show the importance of, of two factor authentication, uh, everyone probably knows about the tar target breach. Uh, that was due to stolen vendor credentials, right? Do you think, uh, at least I do, uh, it's very plausible that that bre breach could have been avoided had they been using two factor authentication because those stolen uh, credentials would have just been like, okay, now where's the pen? Uh, and this all goes to speak to you're not alone. Um, and from a Drupal site, your Drupal site is no longer alone. Um, you know, back five, ten years ago, your site was just your site. It was very self-contained. Now, your site is just a cog in the machine that, that you are building, whether for your client or within your, your own business. Um, you're, you're accessing um, marketing data. You're accessing internal data. You have your intranets. Your <clears throat> your marketing sites, you're going out and you're authenticating to uh, external services, authorized.net, FedEx, you know, PayPal, NodeSquirrel, YouTube, uh, MailChimp, New Relic. All of these are being accessed and they're all trying to do that securely. Uh, and you need to make sure that not only is Drupal being secure, uh, but you're securely walking around and talking to these other services. Yeah, and if you think of uh, Drupal's role in the future of the web, it will uh, even be more so of the, you know, the hub um, integrating with all these different services. So this will be an important security aspect going forward. And you don't want, uh, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of you guys have had this, where uh, just because one service, uh, if you look at the cog, if one service is uh, attacked or one service is uh, breached, you don't want to expose everything else in your system. Um, and it goes back into your daily life. If you have one website login um, that's breached, then all of a sudden, you know, you have to go change your Gizmodo. You're in you have to go through all of your different sites and change them. It's because we no longer live in an isolated web. We, we live in a very connected web. Cool, so we're gonna, um, we're about halfway through. Um, we're gonna go into some tips of securing your stack. These are going to be really high level and not super, uh, super kind of action oriented, but just kind of want to give you an idea of the, you know, what you should be thinking about, maybe uh, a couple little tips, and, uh, you know, this is both for you and your colleagues, how you can think about security. So I'm happy to go into more depth and kind of references and stuff with anybody afterwards, but I think we'll kind of just fall through these. Okay. So to me, it starts, like, I'm, I'm biased, I work at a hosting provider, a website management platform, but I think that's like really one of the, one of the earliest points in the, in the life cycle where you start thinking about security. So there's a lot of the stack kind of broken out into a couple parts, hosting, operating system, down on the line. But uh, to me, when you're evaluating host, hosting, uh, hosting should abs uh, security should ac absolutely be a criterion for evaluating hosting. Uh, you also want to know what the strengths of your team is. You know, if you have a lot of like strong DevOps people, people who understand security, have that security mindset already. You know, maybe you can uh, roll your own a little bit more. If that's not a strength of your team, you know, you want, might want to look at a, a host that can kind of um, complement you there. You don't want to waste if, as a dev shop. You don't want to waste time doing something that isn't in your wheelhouse. I'm not a, a host. I don't do that. So why should I? take on that role and waste my time when I can go be doing better things that can make me happier, my client happier, and the product better. Another another thing to note, kind of picture of a typical corporate data center, and so a lot of people who work in um, uh, kind of bigger orgs, and like there is a security team, and they might be tempted to be like, oh, well, the security team deals with that. Well, that's not the case. Same thing, only you can educate yourself. If you're in this environment, you might have a, you know, some new product, something little tiny fluffy marketing brochureware site, but that's in the corporate firewall. And this has been um, an exploit that, that people have uh, um, utilized before to get into the corporate firewall and get into your entire business through the stupidest thing that nobody cared about but was running in your, in your corporate environment. So that's another thing to think about. Sorry. What else is running <laughs> on that server? What else is running in that uh, network? Securing your OS, right? So Fedora, Ubuntu, whatever it is. The best thing you can do, uh, similar to Drupal, install the security updates, right? There are people, like, this is how you leverage the smart people that are working on security all the time. You just apt get install, like yum upgrade, whatever it is. Um, really, you want to go for a sensible configuration. This is kind of about the mitigation of risk, too. You don't need to lock everything down, but a lot of the defaults on your server really not be help, might not be helping you out that much. A couple things I'd really look into are IP tables, 
SSH, please, please don't use passwords, use certificates. It's just gonna be way better. Um, and uh, and uh, lock down your sudors. Um, so, you know, if you, like, even, you know, we all maybe get a little little buzz when we log in and we get root, but if you're logging in regularly as root or logging in and regularly using like sudo su or something, you are doing this wrong and you are like leaving a vector open. Similarly, um, Nginx and Apache, uh, this, these, like your web server, you know, you should love your web server. And um, uh, so we are, our web server is gonna be one of the quickest places to add or remove headers, lock down stuff like X-Frame options, um, I think I'll show some slides from some of Pantheon's logging and doing another um, session tomorrow uh, around Elasticsearch, which we use for logging. But logs are super important, right? If you get hacked uh, or you've sensed that there's attack going on, you want to understand how they were able to get in or where they were coming from. So also take a keen eye on your web server to um, your access logs, error logs, that kind of thing. That can go a long way to um, kind of understanding what happened and help making you feel a lot less kind of um, vulnerable in the event of, uh, of a breach. Um, yeah, a couple other a couple other little tips. Uh, My SQL is awesome. MariaDB is awesome. We all love them. Drupal, uh, uh, you know, Drupal loves um, My SQL and MariaDB as well. The defaults also don't help you out, right? Change that root password. Lock down so it's not accessible from other hosts. Um, this is a case. Uh, My SQL is great because it's really easy to get started playing with, right? But you know, uh, like that kind of comes at the cost of security a little bit. So question the defaults. Educate yourself. There's you know a handful of five things you can do that will help really lock it down. User root password root is not a good idea. So yeah. I'll just talk a little bit about uh, data encryption. Um, currently within Drupal, there is no native way to encrypt. Um, however, there are a handful of modules, uh, and you can see them up there on the screen. Uh, the thing you need to be really aware, and we touched on it earlier, is uh, you, you need to make sure that that key uh, is taken care of. Um, but but luckily, uh, there are a lot of modules, uh, depending whether you need to encrypt your username, your password, um, form encrypt. Um, you know, you can come talk to us uh, after after the, the talk here. Um, Townsend Security sponsors a lot of these, so. Um, but leading into uh, encryption key management. That is the hard part of uh, security. Um, it's often said that encryption is the hard part of security and encryption key management is the hard part of uh, encryption. Uh, although it doesn't really have to be. Um, because hack hackers don't break encryption, they find your keys. So it's just really a bad idea to have the keys to your kingdom taped essentially to your front door. And that's what you're doing if you're leaving your keys uh, within the Drupal database, settings file. Well, in fairness, maybe that's like under the front doormat. It's like not <laughs> yeah. quite like on the home page, but it's like, you know, if you did get in, you know where, right where to look. Yeah. But, and, and there was a lot of people here talking about compliance. Compliance regulations require uh, key management. And there are standards and best practices for key management defined by NIST, which is the National Institute of Standard and Technology. And, and uh, from our perspective, key management is fundamental to an events in depth approach to data security. So uh, talking about protecting API keys, we talked about this earlier. Um, don't share your API keys with your developers. Um, one of the things that, that I regularly say is um, if you have a, a disgruntled employee, um, do you really want them having access to your MailChimp account so that they can send out email as you? Um, these are steps that you can take uh, in all of these. You can create um, you know, fake accounts, developer accounts, and give those API keys out, but keep the secret keys to yourself. Keep them secret. Don't just pass them around to every developer that you have. And uh, don't let your developers share keys either. Make sure you have enough keys that they can all use. Um, it's just like sharing a password. Uh, so Drupal uh, itself, obviously keep it updated um, with, uh, with Drupal Get and all that uh, that came up last year. Um, it, those security updates and the security team, they know what they're doing and when they publish a security update, um, take it as, um, as a necessity. Don't just you know, look at it and say, nah, I don't think I'm going to do that. Um, Greg, did a, uh, Greg Nadison did a great talk yesterday on uh, Drupal uh, security more in um, how to secure your site and your code. Definitely go look that up if you weren't there and, and go check it out. Uh, the other thing is uh, you've got Drupal 4. 
feedback and whoopers. Sounds like about to get bad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Severin, <laughs> cool. <laughs> Just like low building yeah. hum is coming up here. <laughs> um, so Drupal Core is great, and you can follow all the security updates that they have. But then also, um, no Drupal site is built just around uh, Drupal Core. You have all these contributed modules, and you're basically grabbing somebody else's code and saying, I trust you to come and put code onto my server and into my site. Um, so you need to look at the look at the module. Is it active? Are the people working on it? When was the last update? Who is the maintainer? Do you trust their code? Have you seen them work other, other places? Um, if you see a random uh, module from a random developer that does something that you don't really know, don't install it on your site. Um, and uh, if you do see something like that, you can raise an issue queue um, about uh, security issues, and um, the security team does look through those. Yeah, so I, I think the, the last part of like the technical stack isn't very technical, it's actually your team. And so thinking about like strong passwords, like it doesn't matter if you have the strongest password, but like in the world and it's this long and you, you feel, you know, you have to type it out all every time. And then like your marketing intern has, you know, a, like no password and that's where they come in, right? So it's about building that security consciousness, not just for you, but for your team. Uh, sometimes you can enforce uh, strong passwords through password complexity or enforce, uh, you know, two factor off or kind of enforce, uh, like, kind of, um, you know, enforce uh, security. But uh, you also want to couple that with kind of just building awareness and building that consciousness and talking about security with kind of everyone on your team. So, real quick, and we do want to leave some time for questions um, if there are some. Hopefully, um, you guys are. Uh, thinking about this and have some questions, but we want to tell you some real-world examples of where all of this has played out in in our example or in our um, you know professional lives. Uh, yeah, so I think like um, we all kind of have some war stories, and like we we have a bunch, and um, I'm sure every, like people in the room have some like you know interesting ways they were hacked or thought they might be getting hacked or tra like you know attacks they were seeing, whether it was. Um, you know, a DDoS or kind of, you know, stuff like a base 64 decode eval that they found in their code base or something. So love to talk about that that stuff a little bit brief on. Just going to dig into a couple things. So Drupal get in and also pointing out that uh, Matt's giving a talk in this room at 5 p.m. and it will be an awesome security talk uh, about Drupal get in specifically. Um, but this is like some of our, pan from our Pantheon logging system when we, uh, we were able to kind of um, isolate, you know, the signature of the Drupal get in attacks and, um, uh, and log them and prevent them from having an impact. So we saw that within you know several hours of the exploit being published, we saw just going from A to Z across the platform, you know alphabetically down the uh, domains, uh, the attacks coming in and the attacks that weren't on our site that were in somebody's alphabetical list were like hitting you know GoDaddy or Acquia or anywhere else, right? So pretty like you know that gave me like complete faith in that like you know this is like a targeted attack and we need to get control of it. Um, we talked about SSH attacks a little bit, so like the internet is a crazy place and people are kind of like jiggling doorknobs and um, a tool I like is called fail to ban that uh, locks out people who are attempting, but you know, if you have servers that are accessible to the internet, they are just getting just continuously uh, attacked and you can look in your SSH logs for that and it's generally like this is why you don't want to use a password, uh, you know, it's just that you're just leaving, um, leaving uh, open a vector where somebody doing something really dumb is able to get um, we've seen a couple um, targeted kind of HTTP uh, denial of service attacks. Um, so these are kind of generally for kind of uh, activist sites, sites with kind of a political or social message. Uh, one of them was around a um, uh, this um, uh, band called Pussy Riot that got in some trouble <laughs> um, after making fun of Putin. And uh, so we were hosting an activism site for that that was getting slammed. And um, these aren't super sophisticated attacks, kind of script kitty, but all the more so you don't want that kind of script kitty attack to take down your website. And a good way to prevent those is put a CDN in front um, that's going to be taking the brunt of that that attack. And so your your server, your database, and, and uh, your LAMP stack isn't the one that's taking on the full force of the DDoS. Yeah, there's a couple CDNs in the Expo Hall, I think, and stuff. So definitely, if uh, if you do find yourself on the more might be a target side of the spectrum, uh, yeah, you probably want to go here, and they'll, they can uh, fill you in on how they can help. Uh, for myself, uh, <laughs> I've actually um, been handed a database, um, not once but multiple times, that had 
thousands of credit cards, CCVs, expiration dates. Um, I had a client call me up and say, hey, there's a site that you didn't build, but it's in our system, and we totally forgot to tell you about it, but um, it's storing all of these uh, credit card, and we just had a donor call us and say, you just emailed my Gmail account with my full credit card number. Um, thank you very much. And so, uh, you know, I've had to deal with this multiple times. Another thing that I, I really recommend you doing as a developer is stay in touch with your uh, with your clients. I gave the clients uh, the ability to create web forms, uh, and then I came back when they were having some issues, and they called me up and they said, hey, we're having some issues with uh, a um, homecoming web form we have. I go to it, and they're taking in credit card number, CCV, expiration date, all that, because they wanted to process tickets for their homecoming event. Um, and I had to kindly explain to them that you are using this completely wrong, and you've just really caused a lot of issues. So. Um, in what you're doing, especially there's a lot of e-commerce. Everyone wants to do e-commerce. Everyone wants to take a payment somewhere online now. Uh, do it safe. Do it securely. Do it right. Um, Drupal Commerce is a great, great, great platform to um, build off of. Uh, but it itself is not just the key. You have all these other pieces that build on top of it. You can be running Drupal Commerce, and you can be running it insecurely. Um, so make sure you protect your credit card data. And, and part of this is just... Uh, notifying your clients and, and educating them as well and saying, look, this isn't a best practice. You probably shouldn't just store credit card numbers on a database somewhere, and please don't ever send those to me again. Yeah, um, like if, if um, we were talking about this earlier, and, and e even up until walking away, right, if you don't feel yeah. like you are empowered a, a enough uh, to, um, you know, to communicate that to your client, like that might not be a place you want to be when you get that database of, of credit cards. And, and I've, I've actually done that. I've walked away from a client because it's just like, I can't touch this. This is way too vulnerable, way too much for me, and I just don't want to expose myself and, um, and, and my brand, I guess, or my company, um, to the level of, of insecurity that you're willing to accept. So um, just be, be knowledgeable of it and, and try to educate your clients as much as you can. So... Risk mitigation, I, I mentioned that's one of the other uh, main reasons, aside from compliance, that uh, I have a lot of conversations with uh, members of the Drupal community and just uh, the security community at large. Uh, no one wants to see their names in the headlines for a data breach. Um, I, I, I think uh, Sony had a hard time with that. Uh, that was not good. Uh, but there's going to be brand damage. There's going to be loss of customers and loss of jobs. It's not just... Uh, for a company, it's not just having to do uh, credit monitoring for for all of their customers. There's just you, know, you see that their uh, the stocks are going to tank, and it's just not not a good experience as a whole for 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 businesses. So, I mean, you you just got to do the right thing. Um, on, and I'll use a case study here. Um, we uh, recently uh, partnered with somebody that was uh, working with a international hotel chain. At the hotel chain said, we need uh, someone to build us an intranet. We're going to have uh, employee data in there. And for anyone to even bid on this project, uh, there has to be encryption processes in place. And so uh, luckily, that, that, um, the, the partner came to us and was like, is this something that you guys can help us with? Because we want to win this bid. Uh, and we also need to make sure that we can, uh, you know, not have our name in the headlines for if, when this site get win or if the site gets hacked. Uh, we need we need to protect this data, and so luckily we were able to protect protect them. But I think it's just a great example of uh, someone being proactive with data security. So last, we want to leave you with, okay, you got hacked. Um, everyone, this is their greatest fear. They wake up and all of a sudden you realize this has happened to you. It's no longer something that you've learned about. It's no longer something that you've read about. It is actually happening to you. Don't panic. Um, react. First thing, roll back. Roll back your code. Roll back your database. Go back to a place where you know is secure. Um, and then once you get the, the uh, site secure, review. The, the best thing you can do, because again, we're all going to get hacked at some point, the best thing you can do from it is say, why did I get hacked and how can I prevent that from happening again? Um, and, and review that with the community and, and reach out to other folks. If you have no idea and you're like, I got hacked, my website got defaced and I have no idea what happened, go find somebody because it's going to happen again unless you know what you did uh, and know what you did wrong. Yeah, 
and that's correct. So that's that's a good point. Is that if there are processes in place that uh, if you're in academia that you have to you cannot immediately roll back. Just unplug it, take it offline, do whatever you can. Um, if you're not in academia and you have a um, just a client facing site or a brochure site, um, roll back as fast as possible. Um, and and basically the the first step is protect yourself and protect the site. Um, do whatever that means. If it means you running down to the server room and just yanking the cord out of the wall, then do that because you don't want to allow it to continue to happen. That's a good point. Thank you. So that's kind of the end of what we've got here. Um, we do have some time for questions. If anyone has any questions or comments or war stories or anything like that, um, there's a microphone in the middle if you feel comfortable using it because um, this is recorded so other people on the, the webs can, uh, can hear about it. Hey, howdy. Um, question. So we have a website, and there's a lot of interactivity going on, people signing in, and they put in their information. Um, as far as we know, they're as secure as we can make them. Everything you guys have mentioned, we do. But there's one caveat. When the development lifecycle proceeds, we need to take that database and bring it down to dev, QA, and stage. In doing so, we do a MySQL dump, and that means it includes that PII. Correct. What's your strategy in allowing for that SDLC to continue, but mitigating that risk where when you refresh dev QA and stage with a dev from production, it precludes PII? So from a, from a Drupal standpoint, what I do is, um, and, and I do this on multiple reasons. One is PII. Um, the other is I just don't want to uh, have a dev all of a sudden send an email out. We've got a site that's got a couple million uh, emails on it. I don't want to all of a sudden blast them with a dev email. Uh, so there are ways that you can script it so that on that dump or immediately after that dump happens before it goes back into the other environments that you go through and just scrub all of your data, get it all, all um, out, null it out, do whatever you have to do, um, and automate that process so that it's not up to somebody to click a button and, and do that. Right, so really quick, just to follow up on that. So we, we thought about that, and in the MySQL dump, we thought, well, we could write a script that completely, or actually during the MySQL dump, we'll take two dumps, right? Correct. The first one is schema only. The second one has ignore tables. Correct. And But as soon as you have ignore tables and they're emptied, now those tables have relationships with other tables. Correct. That PII, once it's empty, those relationships are gone. Now your development environment, dev, QA, and stage are useless. Yeah. Th that's tricky, and I think one thing I'll point out is, right, like uh, dev and stage are two different things, right? So you, you might want to just have staging be kind of a more limited access um, uh, uh, with more more like live data. Um, you know, you could, instead of just ignore tables, you could pipe that through uh, a script, which, um, you know, which kind of just jumbled up email yeah. addresses or, you know, something that, that you might consider sufficient. Um, but I think that it, that is a tricky uh, that is a tricky thing. It's kind of it's like kind of a, a fundamental, it's, yeah, fundamental it's like a, trade off, and yeah. it's a one off. That, it depends on the data that you're pushing and pulling. If the data can be jumbled and it doesn't break any relationships, or if you then have to follow the train and make sure that you do the same um, changing to everything, then that's something you can do as well. So one of the things we do really easy is we just change every domain on the U, the um, email list to an internal that just does nothing. Um, so then you just got a bunch of random, you know, strings of, of beginning of email, but you don't have the internals. Um, but again, that's going to be very dependent on each environment you're in. Good question. Uh, building off what the other gentleman said about, you know, he's got to yank the cord as soon as he's attacked. Um, instead of roll back, I would argue redeploy um, on new clean hardware someplace else Correct. with a new host and everything. Correct. Isolation is key. Um, and so. Uh, if you're in an environment um, like a Pantheon or an Aquia that has a, a, an easy flow for that and you're not going to uh, redeploy right away, you can roll back. Um, you, can, you can copy the database back to your dev place uh, or your dev site and then um, roll back. But again, part of the review process is you have to be able to, to know what happened. And if you immediately roll back, um, you're going to lose some of that information. That's a yeah, good point. And that goes back to like why using version control is so important because if someone was able to get code in uh, that, you know, yeah, version control should have that, all that state. So. Hi, so thanks for the talk. It was great. Um, earlier in the talk, it sounded as though you may have alluded to the fact you may 
be using some form of honeypots um, by having other accounts that you just keep out there that you don't use or keep any information in. Do you, in fact, use them? If you do, do you have any recommendations? And how effective do you think they are? Sorry, say that again. The uh, kind of um, the uh, question was around like honey, honey, honeypot accounts for like Drupal, uh, Drupal users, or or kind of SSH or something. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I haven't had um, <laughs> specific experience with that. I, I don't think that's like ultimately that effective. I think that might be kind of fun, but um, but not um, but not probably a, a strategy actually to mitigate your risk. I wouldn't uh, in in most cases I can think of. Um, but um, one kind of thing that's interesting there, and you know, I think part of the DevOps track, I'm big on the cultural aspects of DevOps, and like, do what you need to do to convince people like that this stuff is real and they should be thinking about it. And if that means like somehow like oh, you know having a little honeypot or like looking at visualizing the logs for the SSH attack or the just the authorization failures from Watchdog or whatever else, like. Uh, not quite an effective mitigation strategy, but like a cool way to be like, look, guys, this is actually happening. Like, we need to, you know, right. we need to talk about this and think about this. And here's, you know, here's the visualization of that. So something that might be more suitable for like a high-profile site. So I, I use honeypots just as a general, you know, keep the crud out. Right. Uh, but one of the things you do have to realize is that that honeypot takes processing to mm -hmm. to run, um, and there is a a t very easily targeted DDoS attack where if you know a form has a heavy processing behind it, you can just spam that form. And even if the honeypot's catching those and not doing anything to your data, it can still take your site down. So the honeypot's a good good um, place to go, and it gives you some information. Um, but I wouldn't solely rely on that. Yeah. No, not solely. Looks like a guy over there has a comment to add. Track the IP addresses that they come from, and you can start doing bans as well. Yeah, that, that's kind of a cool way. Is like get people to attack, and then be like, okay, I just know you're malicious, and I'm not gonna, I'm gonna just block you or something. Mm -hmm. With using uh, the keys over passwords, is there any uh, tools that you use for uh, managing that? With for like SSH users? or yeah, SSH or any any keys like that, like key um, management. So within uh, within Drupal, we just. Um, our, it's in beta right now. We're hopefully going to be going to RC this uh, this week. Um, we have a key module that um, we're asking the uh, community to start integrating into some of the more e-commerce and all those logos and stuff. We've already got patches for a lot of those out there. Um, and basically, it centralizes all the key management in Drupal into one spot so that you know where all those keys are. Part of the problem where right now is, is in Drupal, uh, we treat those keys, you know, you're using form API or something like that, and you can use the password um, field to collect that data and it gives you the nice pretty dots mm -hmm. um, but what happens is that password just gets stored in the plane in the in the database and it's getting stored either in your rules config or in your uh, variable table mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're trying that within a Drupal level to, to centralize that key management and then from there um, there's several options available to do that properly off-site and, yeah. and whatnot. Uh, I'll, I'll just add to that, uh, because that's actually where my company lives, um, is encryption key management. So uh, basically, how with a lot of these modules that we're sponsoring and that you can use to encrypt all the various data, uh, like we said, it's important to get it outside of the Drupal installation. And not only just get it separated, but you need to manage those keys. So yeah. each time that you read and write, it changes those keys. So how we do that is just with uh, they used to be call, called hardware security modules. Uh, now you can go to the AWS uh, or Azure or wherever, launch them, and it's just an encryption key management solution. And we have, a, I believe, the only integration with uh, all of these Drupal modules. So that's that's the way. If you look at a lot of compliance requirements, it's going to say you need to be using NIST validated encryption or FIPS 140-2 compliant key management based on industry standards, which those are the industry standards. Uh, and so you, by doing that, you're able to meet compliance, which goes back to the question we asked earlier about how many people needed to meet compliance. Uh, this is a way to provably be meeting compliance. And know. part of the updates we did to the encrypt module as well as allow for configurations. Uh, before, it was always one key, one, one encryption method, and when you change the key, all of a sudden, all the old data was just null. Um, Encrypt now has the ability to, to support multiple keys and cycle the keys and, and do proper management there. Okay. 
and uh, SSH is easy, and I can help you after if you want. Okay. Well, I mean, like, if you have a developer on your team, <coughs> and you have uh, several different places where they use that key, mm -hmm. do you have a central way to manage that key? For the that central developer? way to manage the key in terms of, like, a, a MailChimp key or anything like that? Yeah, say your developer has access to 10 different ten different things, and they use the same key. So you um, individually I manage those? Yeah, yeah, ten different 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 keys. Keys. I would different use keys. different keys. So, okay. you know, you can you can easily spin up a MailChimp. We've, we've done this a couple of times. We just spin up a, a fake MailChimp account mm -hmm. that just sends emails to us. And in reality, if you do all of your dev process around that and at the last minute switch the key, you're totally fine. Um, you know, so that's that's one of the ways that you can manage that. Um, and we're, we're also working on some solutions that will manage that as well. there. Uh, it's actually just more of a comment because um, I was thinking about the uh, the backup um, we're talking about the importance of that so just kind of a experience that we ran into that's worth sharing is that having backups for more than just like the last week can sometimes be important. Uh, we uh, with one of our clients who wanted to handle their hosting all on their own they weren't making security updates to the Drupal platform and then they were hacked a month earlier Yeah. and then none of the backups on the platform we were there on had data that was further back than a week or two weeks, and so having a rollback to be able to go back a month, you know, this so is generally is something I would, you know, just put out there is, yeah. you know, rolling back is not necessarily you're not going to always know about it that day depending on who your client is. So before um, it became very popular to do in the platform level and uh, with options like Node Scroll and stuff, I actually had a, a Bash script that would take. Um, daily backups and then every week it would take one of those and, and store it off as a weekly backup and then it would keep you know five weeks of backups and then do a monthly backup and then do a yearly backup so that you had a directory that's like I could go all the way back one year and not you know you don't you don't store an, a large number of files you're only storing like 10 at the most or, or 10 backups at the most but you can go back um, historically through it and that's a, that's a very good point um, cool I think that's all the time that we have Real so Real quick, we'll answer your question and then we'll run out of here. So okay, cool. so I have some Drupal accounts on shared host. Correct. And I was looking at a, a log yesterday, the recent log entries, and I'm starting to see a lot of page not founds for things like wp-admin, which is the yes. WordPress admin. Correct. Do you have any sense of what's going on and so precautions to take in that case? So shared environments are very... Um, they're cheap and they're easy, but they're also very insecure in that manner because um, a lot of the time somebody will just go to the server and then just start spamming everything on the server with logins. And then it's just them going around shaking door handles waiting for one to open. Um, and so uh, I would not I would log it. I would tell your service provider, hey, I'm seeing these um, come in and I'm seeing an increase of them. Um, but unless they're actually getting at your data or if you have um, – SSH that's insecure or anything like that, then I think you're going to be okay. Yeah, um, I, we, we see that constantly. Yeah. It's just people walking around the internet, grabbing do domain names, jiggling the doorknob, seeing, and if it's, they're looking for WordPress and you're Drupal, he'll be all right. Yeah. And you see him posting and, to and Drupal, it happens Drupal all the time right. on, on your um, on your grid service or anything like that. I had I had a, um, what was it, The there was a caching module, and it would cache all the requests that came in, and I looked at the cache log, and it was just you know all these random um, sites, and they were all just ones that were on a shared host with it. So yeah. very common. I don't think you have to worry about it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Thanks you, guys. So. Uh, for anyone in the first three rows for your close participation, I have a quick present for you. <laughs>